Welcome to Ashburton Presbyterian Church and thank you for joining with us uh, online on this Sunday morning. Uh, if you're a regular uh, attender at Ashburton, we welcome you. Uh, if you're just visiting us online, we also welcome you and thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you would like to uh, get in touch with us and you're not normally part of the church, uh, you can follow the uh, link below on YouTube and uh, you can uh, fill in a, a form to connect with us and, uh, and we will uh, respond to you. As we come to worship this morning, uh, I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 6 to 11. Peter says there, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and watchful. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We learn from Peter that there are two contrasting forces, if you like, acting in the world. There's Satan and his designs that are evil uh, and which are, of course, doomed to failure. Uh, and there is the Lord God who works all things for good, uh, whose rule is sovereign, uh, whose every truth carries with it absolute certainty, whose every word uh, needs no help but is powerful to accomplish everything that he purposes. So Peter calls us to resist the devil's designs and to stand firm in the certainty of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to trust the God of all grace who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ and will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. As we come to worship uh, our God this morning, let's come in prayer and commit our time of worship to him. Father, we thank you that you are the God of all grace, that you have poured out that grace upon us in Jesus Christ, your Son, that we see this grace displayed most clearly on the cross as Jesus bore our sin and suffered and died in our place so that as he rose to resurrection life, we too may have the life that he gives us through faith in him. Thank you that in these days we can trust him uh, because every promise that you make is certain in Jesus Christ, your son. And you who have loved us uh, to the uttermost uh, in giving Jesus, your son, for us uh, will not fail to love us and watch over us and keep us in your care in the day-to-day -day things of life in this world. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you for Jesus. Draw us to him this morning that we might see his beauty, that we might appreciate his glory, that we might have the assurance that our future and our present is all bound up with him. And uh, Father, we pray that you would glorify him in our hearts today, that we might love him and desire him and pursue him 
with all our might and find our greatest joy and delight in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just uh, one brief thing to say by way of announcement. Uh, of course, this week there has been some good news uh, with the announcement of the, the initial steps uh, that will gradually unwind uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, I do need to say that I expect it will be quite some time uh, still before we can worship together in person. Uh, but the session is closely monitoring uh, the changing circumstances and uh, we will seek to return to normal activities uh, uh, gradually as we can uh, and with all the proper uh, and appropriate steps being taken to protect everyone's health uh, in the process. So uh, we will continue to monitor the situation and keep you informed as uh, things unfold and as we make decisions along the way. Well, let's lift our voices this morning in praise to the God who has made us for himself to know him, uh, to love him, uh, and everything that he has made stands to his praise and his glory. Uh, and we are most privileged amongst all of creation in that we can uh, worship him and praise him out of uh, a deep personal relationship with him. So let's join our hearts and voices as we sing together all creatures of our God and King. And uh, following that, we're going to sing in Christ alone as we recall that everything that is ours, everything that is ultimately worthwhile is ours in Christ. So let's join our voices in singing together. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh,
creatures of our God and Sing is going to bring us our first Bible reading for this morning. It is from Galatians 3, uh, verses 15 to 29. Good morning. The first reading is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 29. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or Add to a human covenant that has been newly established. So it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. 
Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God, in His grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implied more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. We continue to work through the New City Catechism. Uh, a catechism is a, a, work, a learning tool uh, where we come to understand uh, and memorize uh, the teachings of Scripture through questions and answers. Uh, we're working through it each week. This week we're up to question 20. And the question is, who is the Redeemer? The answer is this. The only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mark Dever, the uh, senior pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church, uh, makes this comment. He says, The Redeemer is Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. The eternal Son of God became man and lived a real human life like ours. For a little more than 30 years in the first century AD, he lived like you and me. The only difference is that he always trusted God. He trusted him entirely. So if you think of ways like just yesterday and the day before that you should have trusted God and didn't, in those very times, Jesus obeyed God. He trusted that what God knew was better, that he should follow his Father's will. When I look back, on my own life, I know that I haven't lived like that. But the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, has. He is called the Redeemer because he redeems his people. He resets our value. When you redeem something at a store, you turn it in and you get some money for it. When I was a kid, we had redemption stamps. We would save up our stamps and then turn them in to get something else. 
Well, Jesus is what sets our value. He resets our value. He gives us his own life on the cross for all who repent of their sins and trust in him. He is our redeemer. He has valued us, though we have thrown our own lives away by not trusting in our heavenly father, by not obeying him and by not fearing him. He actually came and gave his own life in our place. He lived a life of trust and he died a death that he didn't have to die. But he did it because of his love for us. He gave himself entirely for us so he could, as the Bible says, be our redeemer, the one who rescues us. The image of redemption in the Old Testament is one of God rescuing his people from Egypt, pulling them out of bondage, out of literal slavery. In the New Testament, Jesus the Redeemer rescues us from our natural state of being in bondage to sin, of serving ourselves in destructive ways. But God, in his great love, sent his only begotten Son, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and then rose from the dead in order to bring us to him, to redeem us. That's what we mean when we say Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. So question 20 asks, who is the Redeemer? And it answers, the only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. Let's say this prayer on the screen together. Precious Redeemer, before the world began, you loved us. You gave up your glory to bear our shame. You glorified your Father by obeying him all the way to the cross. You deserve our praise, thanks and worship. We have no hope but in you. Amen. We want to come before the Lord now in a time of confession of our sin, uh, taking comfort and hope from the scripture that the God uh, who gave Jesus to be our Redeemer is the God who, because of Jesus, forgives our sin. So let's uh, join our hearts in prayer together. Father, at times such as we are currently living in, uh, the things our hearts secretly trust in are revealed to us. It is too easy for us to put our trust in riches or in people or in the strength of our own arms. It is too easy to love these things more than we love Jesus and for them to take his place as an alternate saviour. But riches can be lost, people can disappoint, our own strength fails us, and so we realise they are not saviours at all, and what seem, they seem to promise they can't deliver. You are the one who gives us good things but when we put our trust in those good things to make us secure, we find the changes of circumstances leave us in want. And these things are exposed as having no solid foundation. Father, forgive our waywardness. Forgive the transfer of our trust to things that can never bear the weight of that trust. Uh, forgive our forgetfulness of your grace. Forgive us for failing to maintain tender hearts that love Jesus uh, above everything else and joyfully rest every hope in him alone. 
the psalmist pleaded, do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your com compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Father, we would pray with him. Do not remember our sins, but meet us in your compassion. Thank you, Father, that being compassionate, you have already atoned for the iniquity of your people in the death of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our sin-bearer, who died in our place. Thank you that because he died and rose to life and now lives, uh, we, through faith in him, now live forever with him. Thank you that you are faithful. And Father, thank you that even as we pray, you have forgiven us. Draw us to Jesus again to show us his beauty and his glory. Give us faithful hearts and restore our joy, the joy that comes not from things or people, but from your grace, from our relationship with you. Father, thank you that you have answered and you have done what we have asked because we pray these things in Jesus' precious name and for his glory. Amen. One of the sad things about uh, the lockdown is that our Sunday school cannot meet. Uh, but of course the material is being sent out uh, by email uh, each week for parents in the congregation to work through with their children. So parents, I would encourage you to do that and invest in the most important aspect of your children's learning, that they may know Jesus. Uh, Moses said to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy uh, 6, 6 and 7, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Uh, parents, may God bless you as you seek to do this with your children, particularly at this time. When we sing the, the next hymn, uh, if we were gathered together, we would of course normally take up uh, the offering as well as the children going out to Sunday school. Uh, of course, we're not meeting in person at the moment, but we recognise that many of you continue to support the work of the gospel uh, by giving online uh, to the church. And uh, we want to pray now just to commit those offerings to the Lord. Father, we thank you for every good gift you pour out upon us. Uh, thank you for your blessings uh, that are fresh every day to us. Uh, and every day uh, and all that it holds and everything you give is, uh, is out of your grace. Uh, Father, thank you that you have given us so much. Uh, and yet it is not ours, it is yours. And Father, we... Uh, are simply stewards who are entrusted to care for and, and use what you have given us for the glory of Jesus. So as we give back to you, we, we pray that you would take these offerings, uh, Lord, that are given online and use them for your glory, uh, use them for furthering the kingdom, uh, use them uh, to continue the work of the gospel even this, in this time of lockdown. Uh, use them to help us to prepare, to be a people ready to bring glory to Jesus and, and to share the good news that we know uh, as uh, we also come out of this lockdown. Uh, and Father, we pray that even through this time, the gospel might prosper in the hearts and lives of people and, and reach them in new and different ways. So we commit all these things to you. We commit these offerings to you. We commit ourselves to you. 
uh, and ask that you would glorify Jesus, your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to join our voices now as we uh, sing uh, together. Uh, Come, behold the wondrous mystery. Let us recall the words of uh, David in Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are sovereign and nothing is beyond your control. We thank you that we can put our trust in you even when we have not been able to gather in worship but have had to meet with the help of modern technology. We thank you that we are still able to sing your praises and hear your word read and preached. We confess that there is not a lot of fear in this nation and that the severe restrictions have done little to allay those fears even while the impact of the coronavirus has been minimised. We thank you that so few lives have been lost to the virus and the main impact seems to be behind us. We pray again today for continued efforts to reduce the impact of the virus in other places. 
We also pray for great wisdom in leadership as countries see the effect on their hospital systems and medical staff who minister to their patients. We thank you that moves are now afoot to ease the restrictions in Australia. We pray that our governments may reverse the emergency powers steadily and allow life to return to its more usual form. We pray for the many people who have been out of work to be able to return as soon as possible. We know that you have created us to work rather than to be idle. We pray that your people everywhere may be bold and yet wise as our freedom of movement is restored so that we express our trust in you in everything that we do. May we be beacons of light within our communities, living according to the truth you have revealed to us in your word. Here in Ashburton we pray for wisdom for the session, the board and other leaders as they plan ahead for the restoration of our various ministries, whenever that may be. But until then we continue to uphold Barry, Mook, the musicians and others who take part in our video services so that we are still able to hear your word read and preached. And we ask for your encouragement in our own times of reading your word and praying for each other so that when we are able to meet again, our fellowship may be enriched and stronger despite this time of separation. In everything we do, whether in good times or in difficult times such as these, may we strive to make known Jesus' great and precious name, in which we pray all these things. Amen. Our second Bible reading uh, this morning and our text for today comes from Acts chapter 8 and verses 26 to 39 and Marjo is going to bring us that reading. The second reading for today is from Acts chapter 8 starting at verse 26 and reading to the end. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candake, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? And he ordered the chariot to stop. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Just before uh, Mook opens God's word to us this morning, uh, we're going to join in praise of the Lord again, uh, dwelling on his love expressed so clearly toward us in Jesus Christ, his son. Uh, we're going to sing, What Love, My God. As we sing, uh, may we have that deep consciousness uh, impressed upon us of God's great love for us. Let's sing together. What love, my God, would bring you down to earth. 
Lord King would take a low and lonely birth. Yet to this dark and broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you had made. What love, my God, would send the way of life to walk the road rejected and despised that you might know As we come to God's word here this morning, let's ask for his help in understanding it. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word that you have given to us. We thank you that you continue to guide, you continue to teach, that you continue to correct and lead us. And Father, we just ask that we come with humble hearts and ears as we listen to your voice and your teaching 
and we ask that you'll be guiding us here this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So there you are in a cafe, having your coffee, minding your own business. And then the person next to you begins talking to you. It begins with the sort of normal greetings, you know, the hello, how are you? And then your conversation expands and you begin to touch on wider issues and topics. In some cases, maybe it is a relief to know that the person that you are speaking with is a fellow Christian or fellow churchgoer. And you begin um, to talk about your faith and what church you go to and so on and so on. And you might go home afterwards and you might thank God that you had had that conversation and believe that it was a spirit-led meeting. But what happens when there are times that the more you talk to this certain someone, you realise that this person has no sympathy for religion and the Christian worldview? Is this a conversation that I would like to avoid? Has the Spirit led me to have this conversation with someone who has completely different values to me? When they begin to make fun of God, when they start questioning how someone like you can believe in such a fairy tale like the Bible, when they start questioning who you are and what you believe, what do you do and what do you say? I remember I had a conversation with a friend, and this was one of our very first conversations, so we didn't really know each other that well at the time. And I was just speaking about, you know, just how much I couldn't stand about, you know, people or why people would choose to smoke, only for him to say a little bit later on that he, in fact, does. Awkward, right? Now, what do you do in that situation? Do you try to save the moment? Or do you try to run away from the moment? Do you decide to yourself, you know what, hey man, I don't think we can be friends anymore. I don't think that this can go on. Or do you develop a strong enough friendship with that person to be able to speak truthfully and lovingly about Jesus and how he can loosen his dependence on his cigarettes or what other things that he might depend on and tighten his dependence of Jesus? As we continue to look at the movement of the early church, especially Philip here this morning, What is clear from Philip's life of evangelism at witnessing is that it is never predictable. From witnessing to a mass crowd, God has completely sort of flipped it around, flipped the situation, and we see that he is speaking just to a single person. Many times, if not at all, we don't get to choose who we get to speak to, and who we don't. You could even say the same with our conversations. A lot of times, it doesn't go exactly the way that we think it will. Maybe there'll be a curveball being thrown at you. Or maybe there might be times where there's a clear avenue to speak about the gospel. We just don't know. So how do we manage How do we effectively witness, I guess, in this nature of unpredictability? The first point might be a little bit obvious, but it is to follow God's lead. But this is the thing. When we talk about God's lead, we see in today's passage that God is clear and he is direct in his leading. On three separate occasions, Philip is led. And we'll have a look at these three passages. First is verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. In verse 29, it is said that, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go go over and join his chariot. And then at the end, once the witnessing was done in verse 39, it says that the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away 
and the eunuch saw him no more. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. It is quite easy to assume that God perhaps doesn't act in the same way now. He's not as direct, he's not as clear. Because possibly we might say, we don't hear a voice in our ears telling us where to go and to talk to this certain someone. However, knowing that God is an unchanging God, why wouldn't God be just as direct now? Is it really that God is not leading us, that he is not here and telling us where to go? Or is it that it is our ears that are in fact shut? When you are on a missions trip and your group is doing an activity and most of the people are involved and you see this certain someone out on the side, on the outskirts, maybe he's unable to fit in for some certain reason, and that person comes to your attention, isn't that your invitation to go and speak with them? When there is someone in your office, perhaps it is your direct working partner, or maybe it's just a colleague who works at a different station to you, who is visibly stressed or who is not him or herself, and you are alone with them in maybe the break room, Does it cross your mind that maybe it is God who have put you two together, not by coincidence? You see, God spoke to Philip, and Philip, in response, obeyed and followed God's call. But we are not to misunderstand that Philip had any clue where and what the Lord was leading him into. We read on in verse 27, it says, And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Philip ran to him and heard him read Isaiah the prophet. If we look back to an earlier or earlier in the chapter, we see that we are picking things up from Philip's witnessing in Samaria, where his ministry was flourishing and many people were gathering to hear the gospel. From the highs of that ministry there, God was calling him to go to a place which the scripture calls and describes a desert place. You know, what would God possibly want from me there, Philip could have thought. Who would possibly be there on that road? You know, a road that hasn't been used in such a long time. Who can I preach the gospel to there? And then when he realized that there was a person on his chariot, slowly making his way south towards Africa, it was none other than a foreigner. Possibly a nationality that he didn't know. And he was also a court official of, for the queen, of Ethiopia. You know, how different is this person? You know, a difference that would have possibly made a lot of people in the church today sort of second guess whether this is the right person that God has put in front of me, whether this is the person that God wants me to speak to. And we know that even some of the apostles were affected by, even not even to a difference of this extent, when we remember Peter who feared the Jewish group when he was eating with the Gentiles. But we see here that Philip didn't back away, no matter how possibly random it might have been for him. We see that each direction that was given to him, he obeyed, knowing that God would spread the gospel 
to unreached groups, people who were vastly different to him. Even when Philip wasn't sure where God would send him, he was ready to obey and faithfully witnessed no matter who it was to. So the question we have to, we have to ask ourselves is this, are we ready? Are you ready to be led by God no matter how unpredictable it may be? We have spoken about one of our idols, you know, throughout the, the sermon series over the last couple of years, and we spoke about how some of the idols may be comfort and security. When we think about it, you know, I guess this idol of comfort and security doesn't just express itself from, you know, watching YouTube videos, you know, sort of wanting less struggle at work or having more money to have a more stable life. Sometimes it can, in fact, be revealed in our response to God's call. You know, like, I, I can't be bothered right now. Like, I can't be bothered talking to this person right now. And I'm having my coffee. I, I'll, it's my relaxing time. It's my peace and quiet time. You know, I don't, want, I don't want to have that conversation. Or possibly we could sort of think, you know, like, I don't want to look like a weird person speaking about, really speaking about God. You know, I don't mind it if it was in the confines of church. But, you know, when I'm outside amongst secular people, I just want to fit in. Like, you know, I don't want to be that weird one. Remember in Mark's gospel, the, the account of Jesus calling his disciples. And we see that Simon, Andrew, James and John were all in their fishing boats, just minding their own business. When Jesus said to them, follow me, it was their faith that allowed them to just drop their fishing nets, leave their family, leave their business, and follow him. Even though they had no idea where it would lead them. Are you ready for when God calls you to be the witness of Jesus? As we continue to read about the meeting between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, effective witnessing comes from a passion for the gospel and for Jesus to be known. Got a bit of a long passage here, but we'll continue reading on. It says, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. When we are talking about a passion for the gospel for Philip, we cannot forget the hunger for the gospel from the eunuch. Rico Tice says that there's two sides of the story when it comes to evangelism. Yes, there is the side of the hostility which could frighten us, which could give us, I guess, a second, a second thought about speaking to people about the gospel. But the other side is, once we cross that pain threshold, we are able to see that there is an increase of hunger for truth. What we know of the eunuch is that he was castrated so that he can serve the queen. 
and he was the carer of her treasure. He's also an Ethiopian man, um, not quite the Ethiopia that we know today. It's more like Sudan now. And he was traveling back from Jerusalem after worshipping there, suggesting that he was a Jewish convert of some sort or a God-fearer of the Jewish God who is hungry for the truth, who is wanting to know truth no matter what external sort of expressions he gave off. And this um, passion and this hunger for truth, it comes by an omission that he is needing guidance to understand and he, the, the asking of the question about whom does a prophet say this about himself or is he talking about someone else? You know, and that hunger for the gospel would not have been known unless if Peter first initiated that conversation by asking, do you understand what you are reading? And we know that the truth that the eunuch was after, it was not about just another ordinary man, was it? It wasn't just about another prophet or just another humanly king. Who was he who was like a sheep taken to the slaughter? The lamb who was silent on the road to death. A man who was humiliated in front of a massive crowd and suffered such injustice. Who is he? And as Philip opened his mouth, he would have explained the gospel that the innocent blood that was spilled on the cross saved the lives of the guilty. That God's son, not too long ago, was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And brother, that includes you too. And now this Jesus who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, the innocent blood to save the guilty, he is now risen again at the right hand of the Father and he is reigning as he has defeated sin and death and he is growing the church and the gospel is spreading and we see that he is building his kingdom here. What significance it would have been for this eunuch to hear such good news. The gospel of sins forgiven by the ultimate sacrifice. For because of his castration, he was unable to fully participate in this Jewish worship. But now he had a God that he was able to freely worship through what Jesus has done for him on the cross. What great news that God came to him, sought to preach the gospel to him so that he may be liberated from the restrictions and that his sins may be forgiven. Perhaps you are a little bit like me where you think you're a little bit slow on your feet. You know, you are worried that um, you will, I guess, draw blanks while you're either answering questions or just having a normal conversation. And yeah, you won't be able to keep up. Or perhaps um, there are other reasons why you believe that um, you are unable to speak to others about the gospel and that you feel like you're just not ready yet for this stage to speak about Jesus. When we look at scripture, we see that God doesn't always use the best speakers to convey his message to his people. Moses, who was needing to actually go to Pharaoh's palace and speak to Pharaoh directly and to speak to his representatives, who are all very eloquent and good speakers. He says this about himself. He says, I am not eloquent, God. 
I am slow of speech and of tongue. I don't know what you want from me. And we see that Apostle Paul frequently also, no matter how much he preached and how many letters he wrote, he frequently lets the church know that he doesn't speak with eloquence, but only speaks of Jesus and him crucified. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 2. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom. But it was in demonstration of spirit, of the spirit and of power. On the flip side, we saw last week that Simon, a magician, he thought, He had such great influence, he had such great ability that he deserved the power that the apostles had. So he tried to sort of pay them off, didn't he? Tried to pay the apostles so that he might have the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the apostles just brushed him away, saying that your heart is not right with God. You see, speaking about the gospel isn't about saying things. It's not about eloquence. It's not about, I suppose, human wisdom. But it is actually having a passion for the gospel. That Jesus has so captured our imagination that we just cannot help Speak about him and the good news like Philip did to this eunuch. If our hearts are worried that you know we won't say the right things or we won't say things well and that we won't make sense, Scripture and Jesus asks us just one question. Do you love him? Do you have a passion for Jesus and the gospel? If you do, Jesus says, follow me. And I'm wondering if you can respond to that call from Jesus here this morning. After hearing the gospel, we see that transformation of the eunuch. We see the transforming work of God in the Ethiopian eunuch. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch responded to the gospel and he was baptized. And we see that he rejoiced despite the departure of Philip. There was no time to build a personal relationship. There was no time to even ask the question, what is next? You know, what do I do now? But the very fact that this didn't faze him shows that he had, or it shows that the newly found relationship that he found with God was sufficient for him, the eunuch, and it brought him much joy. And this is a lot more significant than maybe what we might think on first reading. Because how often do we see today that people, instead of actually following Jesus and finding joy in Jesus, they in fact follow their pastor or they follow their mentor or their leader. They trust the human, I suppose, mentorship and leadership rather than following God, the Heavenly Father, and trusting wholly in Him. But we see that the eunuch didn't cling to Philip. 
but his heart was transformed so that only he, the only person he would follow is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here that the gospel was preached. And we see here that the gospel continued to spread now into northern Africa. As God said, the whole world, the word will be preached. And we see the continuation of it this morning. This transformation of the eunuch is just... As I was reading, it reminded me of Galatians 3. And just towards the end of Galatians 3, it reads this. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, as according to the promise. Abraham's offspring was never to be about just a certain, one certain group. But this is not just talking about just ethnicity and culture. It is also talking about class. It is also talking about gender. You see, God will save who he chooses to save, no matter where they are from. And in times, he will open the door for us to speak to someone possibly from a different ethnicity, a different culture, maybe one that we don't quite understand. He'll have us speak to someone from a different class, a different life stage or a different lifestyle. And possibly he might even open the door to us to speak to someone who have all of that all at once. So we don't get to choose who we witness to. We don't get to pick and choose like when we when we were in primary school and we were playing when we were playing sports and we need to make teams. You have two captains and you have the rest of the classroom lined up and you get to choose who you would like in your team. It's not like that. We don't get to choose who we speak to and who we witness to. But God will present an opportunity for us and he will lead us. So are we willing to witness despite of our lack of choice? Are we willing to follow God's lead and surrender that to him? so that we can preach the good news to someone like the Ethiopian eunuch. I suppose this passage could be seen as sort of like a typical example of evangelism, as if every time we speak to someone about the gospel in this sort of way, it will turn out just like this. It will turn out just as as successful as this. But we know that that is not the case, don't we? People will reject the gospel just as they did Jesus when he was on earth. Some might appear to be accepting of the gospel, but just like they did when Jesus was showing his miracles and signs, they will just come from a a consumer mindset. They will just see it as something that benefits them for a short period of time. You see, this account of Philip and the eunuch is not a map of do it this way and you'll have a high success rate. Do it this way, you will not face persecution. Do it this way and you won't feel any pain or worries about your evangelism. But it is asking this. It is asking us, do you trust the sovereign God and his leading? 
Do you trust that he is using all our conversations and all our encounters, whether it be with friends, family or strangers? Sam Chance says this, at any moment, he, God, might use our gospel message, no matter how poorly gifted we are, as the natural means to bring someone to salvation. If we don't believe that each encounter with someone is a chance to share the gospel, friends, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for this so perfectly planned setup? Are we waiting for you know the perfect moment? You know, waiting for this signal from God? Are we only willing to speak to someone when I suppose it is organized, when the church organizes some outreach? Is it only in those times that we are willing to speak about the gospel? One example of a conversation that I remember fondly is probably actually one of the most memorable conversations that I had um, with a mate. And it was at McDonald's at 12 a.m. after a futsal game. And the reason why it was memorable to me is because, one, it was just so unexpected, and two, it was at the car park in the cold while our friends were enjoying the warmth and the food inside. But suddenly, as we're walking to our cars, and after I'm pretty sure, you know, we spoke about something useless for a good amount of time, we suddenly spoke about God. And although it didn't follow up to anything at the time, I am hoping that that conversation had planted seeds in his heart and his life, so that Hopefully, some down, sometime down in the future, he might find Jesus. But it was just out of the blue. Now, God opened up that door out of nowhere. And in those moments, will we be ready to speak about Jesus and be a witness to him? Friends, If you feel like you are under pressure to convert, God graciously doesn't give us that role. He doesn't leave that to our own hands. Only God himself, through his son, can save. And he will surely save and he will surely transform those he chooses. God didn't send Philip because Philip was going to save the unique. God didn't save the apostles out all over Jerusalem and all the the deacons and the Christians to different parts of the world because they are the ones who are going to save those nations and cities. God himself has already mapped that out. So that shouldn't be our worries and so that isn't a burden that we carry but the gospel that has transformed our lives Christ the one who faced injustice so that the guilty you and I you know who mocked him and despised him despised him Now, this Christ who has redeemed us, who has saved us, who has changed our life, isn't he worth sharing about? Isn't he worth witnessing about? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that your gospel continues to be spread no matter what the situation may be. That even though we know the church dispersed you, we know that you used it for your own good and we know that that was the beginning of the gospel spreading throughout, throughout the world. And Father, so many times, you know, you call us 
to share the gospel and for whatever reason it may be, we, we, we may be a bit afraid, a bit scared, a little bit unwilling. Father, we pray that you'll just captivate our hearts so much so that you know, we just cannot help share the gospel. Father, keep working in our hearts, we pray, so that we don't live a life of fear of men and of other people, but we just live in the glorious grace of our Lord Jesus and that we live in the life in the love that we have received and that we'll be able to share that love with other people. Father, continue to remind us of the gospel, we pray, so that we will be able to share it. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. As we conclude our service here this morning, we'll be once again singing praise to God, singing of the, the task that is unfinished, the calling from God to preach the gospel to the world. We'll be singing together, facing a task unfinished. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees.
benediction this morning comes from Romans 15, 5 to 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.